welcome you, although the reasons for us gathering here are perhaps not as, as savory as one would like. Over the last few weeks, as we know, uh, the immigration discussions of immigration have been at the center of South African politics, oddly linked to questions of, of not only crime and, and jobs, which has been the, the kind of standard refrain for the past 20 years, but really now linked much more to not only security and crime on the street, but questions of, of state security, state sovereignty, and the very nature of, of politics. And we've seen, whereas in the past, there's been quite a lot of sort of resistance to discussions of, of immigration control and closure from within government, we've now seen a kind of alignment among both the ANC and, and the DA, not the EFF, uh, with each of the parties really trying to be as strong as possible on questions of immigration racing each other to say, which is tougher? Who could do more? How do we control this? And I think lost in some of this discussion is really what does this mean for South Africa's future? What does the kind of policing of migrant bodies, what is the policing of counterfeit goods, what does a discussion of a, of a continent or a country surrounded by other uh, immigrants or migrants in the country, what is the closure of our borders or the attempt to do so mean for the way in which we relate uh, to the rest of the continent and really to the rest of the world. Much of what's happening in South Africa has echoes of what is happening elsewhere in Europe, the United States, uh, elsewhere on the continent even, but of course with our own particularities, with the particularities of South Africa's transformation, the, the efforts to transform following the Zuma years, efforts at accountability among the police, a series of questions that are perhaps particularly acute in, in the South African environment. We've been talking about, at ACMS, we've been talking for years about questions of, of migration, obviously, in our name, questions of xenophobia, but we've realized that we have not stimulated and have not managed to be part of a national discussion, and some of that has been because we, and I think many of the other people who are concerned with immigration, have tended to fo focus largely on the welfare, the human rights, the interests of the migrant population themselves. And clearly that is a population that we care about and hopefully everyone cares about, but it's also a population that doesn't, is, is not a, popu uh, a group that South Africans generally care much about. And in fact, our, our sort of sense is that the more we talk about strategies and, and actions that hurt migrants, the more people celebrate them. Uh, because those people from many South Africans shouldn't be here to begin with. And that's part of the language that we've heard over the last few weeks. So part of what we're trying to do today is not only think about to reframe that discussion, but to think about what this means for South Africa and South Africans more broadly. We don't have, uh, unusually for us, we don't have a, a representative from a kind of migrant advocacy group on the panel. Rather, we have a, a group of, of commentators, analysts, scholars, who have thought about different issues in South African politics, all of which intersect quite directly with questions of migration, but who are not necessarily migrant advocates, migrant, uh, uh, kind of, or migrants themselves. So I'm going to just introduce our panel, which is, as you can see, quite an elaborate group of people. I'm going to introduce them quickly, and then basically hand it over to them. We're going to give them each five to seven minutes to speak, uh, and then we're going to open it up for discussion from you, uh, since we are live streaming it, which is our first time ever for ACMS, so it's a big day for us. Um, and we're, it's also being live tweeted by Karabo, who's up there. But if you'd like to add your comments to the con to the conversation on Twitter, you can you can uh, it's hashtag Imig Mzanzi, or you can you can tag us at ZenoWatch One. Sinidile, who's sitting here, is monitoring. I'm sure our Twitter feed is just blowing up already. Yeah. Um, so you can you can you can tag us. Uh, we'll read those questions also as part of, of the discussion. Uh, Afterwards, we invite you, we have some cool drinks, we couldn't afford beer and wine, but we have some other things outside, uh, which you're welcome to join us to continue the conversation out there. So I'm gonna introduce the, the panel in the order that I've asked them to speak. Uh, the first is Jan Borman, one of our own students, uh, but a, a journalist who is with the new frame, uh, a new, celebrating his one year anniversary, so congratulations, writing about migration, refugees, and asylum seekers, and xenophobia. He previously worked with the Sunday Times, the Times, News 24, and uh, as I said, holds an MA from us, from the Migration Displacement Fund. 
AC Manstead Vids. Next to him, to his left, on the far right of the panel, is my colleague, Dr. Jean-Pierre Bissago. He's a researcher with the African Center for Migration and Society, who is focusing on migration, identity and belonging, social cohesion, xenophobia, violent outsider exclusion, and governance of migration and human mobility. He also is the coordinator of Xenowatch, which is an uh, online platform, crowdsourced platform, uh, that monitors and analyzes xenophobic violence in South Africa. Sorry. All right. Next, we have who's in our in, this, in Adam's seat. We have um, <laughs> Garrett <laughs> Garrett Newham from the Institute of Security Studies, who's joined us uh, from Pretoria, has spent over 20 years working to promote public safety and justice in South Africa, and currently heads ISS's Justice and Violence Program. Uh, which consists of a team of people working to inform government policy and promote public awareness about evidence on effective responses to violence, crime, and corruption. He joined the ISS in 2010, which is an independent pan-African organization that provides authoritative policy research, technical support, and capacity building to enhance human security across Africa. To his right is uh, another colleague from BITS, uh, Dr. Julia Hornberger, who is a, a social anthropologist uh, we still like her, a social anthropologist, <laughs> working on questions of policing and, and health. Uh, she started her work, her academic work, focusing on policing and human rights in Johannesburg, and has been tracing how South Africa's burgeoning human rights regime, on the one hand, and the various interactions with people living under circumstances of great uncertainty and insecurity on the other, have transformed policing in the post-apartheid years. In 2011, she published her very excellent book, Human Rights and Policing, The Meaning of Violence and Justice in the Everyday Practice of Policing in Johannesburg. More recently, and, and part of the reason that we invited her to join us tonight, is that she shifted her focus towards policing of health and intellectual property rights uh, in a project funded by the German Foundation on International Crime Control and the Circulation of Fake and Substandard Medication. She explored the ways in which questions of health, security, and the market intersect around the figure of the pharmaceutical copy globally and in South Africa in particular. So given the, the centrality of uh, the discourse around counterfeit goods and their threat to South Africa, we thought there would be no one else to, uh, better to join us. On your far left uh, is Koketsu Moeti, who I'm meeting tonight for the first time. He's a long background in civic activism and over the years has worked at the intersection of governance, communication, and citizen action. She currently serves as the founding executive director of Amandla Mobi, Amandla Dot Mobi, how do you say? Dot Mobi. Dot yes. A community of over 250,000 people working to turn every cell phone into a democracy building tool. So there's an irony that her phone is not just working. <laughs> of all of us, of course. Uh, to ensure that those most affected by injustice, low income black women in particular, can take collective action on issues affecting their lives. In 2019, Mordi was announced as an Atlantic Fellow for Racial Equity. Congratulations. She's also an inaugural Obama Foundation Fellow and an Aspen Institute New Voices Senior Fellow. Uh, she also serves as the Deputy Chairperson of the SOS Coalition, a coalition of South African organizations committed to and campaigning for public broadcasting in the public interest, as well as a reference member of the Civic Tech Innovation Network. And last but not least, um, we've invited uh, Tinuko Maluleke, who's a senior research fellow and the deputy director of the University of Pretoria Center for the Advancement of Scholarship. An NRF rated researcher, uh, he is an elected member of the South African Academy of Science. He has held various executive positions at a number of South African universities and serves on the board of the NRF and the MTNSA Foundation. He's a member of the judging panel for the National Allen Patent Prize for nonfiction books and for the MTN Radio Awards and a regular columnist on various print and broadcast media platforms. So, you know who's in front of you. You, un you can already understand why they're here, I think. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over now to Jan uh, to start the discussion. Uh, I'd like to again thank all of our panelists for joining us and, and all of you for joining us in the audience. Um, thanks, Lauren. Um, I just want to start by reading a few quotes which are statements uh, made by police um, and government officials in recent weeks or months. Um, 
Lieutenant General Elias Mawela has condemned the incessant undermining of the authority of the state by these foreign nationals in the Johannesburg CBD. Um, this comment was made following the first um, unsuccessful raid um, earlier this month in the Johannesburg CBD. Um, then the Gauteng MEC for Community Safety, Faith Mazibuko, said, uh, we condemn the attacks on police and members of other law enforcement agencies. We condemn all criminal elements hellbent on undermining the rule of law in this country and making this country ungovernable. We can't co-govern with criminals, especially foreign nationals who want to turn our country into a lawless banana republic. Um, those are recent comments, but um, other ministers have, uh, ministers and uh, politicians have chimed in as well. Um, former Minister of Health, Aaron Wittoledi, and now Minister of Home Affairs has said, the weight that foreign nationals are bringing to the country has nothing to do with xenophobia. It's a reality, our hospitals are full, we can't control them. And then Khaten Premier David Makura um, has made numerous state statements about health and criminality um, in the province. Uh, this one stood out for me. Um, some specific crimes, specific nationalities are involved. Drugs, violence, murders, and CIT heist. To say this is not to make a particular, particular nationality a problem. The police have to crack down. How often do you find Nigerians involved in drugs? Um, and then I wanted to use a quote from uh, Joburg Mayor Herman Mashaba, but there are too many to pick from. Um, the one that stands out for me was last year when he made a citizen's arrest um, in the drug of CBD um, of a street trader who was pushing around um, cow's head. And the criticism, he received a lot of criticism and following that he tweeted about um, these people bringing Ebola's into the country. Um, so I think that's an important place to start is to look at the language that uh, these politicians use. Um, there's been a long uh, history um, from Hitler's Germany to Rwanda before the genocide of dehumanizing people um, and especially looking at um, health concerns and making them disease ridden. Um, and you see, We've currently seen that all throughout the world, whether it's Modi's India or Victor Orban's Hungary, um, Trump, Bolsonaro in Brazil. So I think that's an important place to start for us. Um, and the, the raids on undocumented um, migrants and selling counterfeit goods. Um, the police went in there at the beginning of the month um, and I think shopkeepers and street traders who have been particularly, um, they've been harassed, they've been, uh, cops take bribes from them for whatever reason. So when the, I think when the police came in earlier this month, uh, people were hurtful and they um, decided to fight back. The police was, I think, um, Gareth might be able to comment on it later, but they, they were quite embarrassed following that. Um, a week later, they decide to uh, have another raid. Um, and the Houghton police spokesperson tell, told me in the morning that we want to reassert the authority of the state. Um, so they went, a massive police contingent, they went in there with, with <coughs> the idea of um, showing which boss. Um, and I think these views and these opinions that we just shared earlier had um, motivated people's attitudes, or the police's attitudes during this raid. Um, while we were there, um, as the police were conducting the raids, um, they made some really gross statements and comments just in passing. Um, some of the comments were like, they illegals, they don't have the proper paperwork, uh, between you and me, the more we get rid of, the more of them we get rid of, the better the country will be. Uh, one officer said, one officer said uh, Johannesburg is clean for the first time in my life. Um, and I, I think that that's where we find ourselves uh, globally, um, as there's a global shift to the right, as fashion takes hold in many countries. 
um, dehumanizing and marginalizing migrants have become the norm. Um, and then, I, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but while these raids were taking place, uh, there was a mob that formed a right in full view of, of the police, um, police conducting raids, and the mob formed and it moved away from the fashion district area and the CBD and started attacking shops, intimidating people and looting shops. Um, and maybe an hour or so in, um, a police van pulled up right after they looted some shops in Mabaneng. And the police officer just spoke to them and let them go. And the mob carried on, went to the Jeff Men's hostel to try and mobilize more people, came back um, a few hours later, came back to the fashion district area where the raids were happening, and started attacking shops, destroying people's cars and property. Um, and again, in full view of police officers, um, myself and my colleague James, who's there, saw police officers lean against the car and just watched as all of this was happening. Um, and, yeah, um, the, the police turned around and said later on that uh, they can't link the two incidents uh, and tried to downplay it um, and said that there was some criminality that happened. And this idea of criminality is something that happens quite a lot um, where when police talk about xenophobic attacks, um, they, they always tend to try and downplay it and call it a random acts of crime or anything like that. In um, trying to wrap up, um, this is not a one sort of incident. In the days following that, the police conducted another raid in the Hillbrow, in Hillbrow, and um, I've got unconfirmed reports that a Malawian man died in the process. Um, there's been incidents of residents from Alexandra deciding to that they will carry out raids of suspicious homes in Orange Grove. There was looting in Soweto, and since Friday there have been um, unrest in Richards Bay, um, where uh, about a month ago two other people were killed in a xenophobic incident as well. So it is not stopping, and um, I want, I, I'd love to hear what my colleagues here think, but it's, it's because of the language and how it's become normalized to, to share these views and challenge.
inspired by speeches, by pronouncements by, by political leaders and, and state officials. So I'm going to share some reflections on the implications of folk violence for the South African society as a whole. So these reflections are informed by more than a decade of research and analysis on the violence. And if you want more information, you can, you can look at this and watch for numbers and, 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 and the analysis. My message today, which also comes uh, from that analysis, is that xenophobic violence is not just about immigration and immigrants. It's rather, first and foremost, a governance and a rule of law issue. And as such, it has implications for the South African society as a whole not just the targeted uh, foreign population. I'm going to give you a few examples of that. Every incident, every time there's an attack on foreign nationals, both South African citizens get affected in terms of loss of life, but also in terms of loss of property or livelihood assets. South Africans die, they lose their houses, their buildings, and they lose income because of uh, uh, foreigners letting their, their properties. We have gathered enough today to show that governance at different levels from, from national to provincial to municipal, but also community level, facilitates xenophobic violence in areas where it happens. The facilitation happens in two ways, either through direct involvement, mayors involved, councillors, city committees involved, or just by lowering the, the cost of the action of the perpetrators, meaning that perpetrators can commit that kind of violence or crime, there are no consequences, there's no accountability. And let's not fool ourselves, xenophobic violence is not an irrational or spontaneous um, outbreak. It's a rational choice people make after weighing up costs and benefits. And when benefits outweigh cost, why not? That's we see violence continues because it has more benefits than, than cost. Who are our investigators, investigators of the violence? Usually we see informal leaders who have taken over the authority of state in those areas and who are using violence to further their own political agendas. These groups target foreign nationals but also citizens. We have many examples where people, South Africans, are excluded from opportunities, from jobs, because they were not born in those particular locations. So it's not just so that there are foreign nationals who have been excluded, but also um, South Africans who come from different, different regions, different uh, townships. So this shows that this virus is not really about foreign nationals. Yeah? It's about people, some people deciding who has the right to live or die, who can reside here or who can't. And that's dangerous because everybody is an outsider in some ways. There's another example around the ongoing track violence. I'm, I'm sure you have heard about it. A group called, what's the name again? Um, All Track Drivers Foundation has been attacking foreign drivers for a long time, but now they have shifted their, 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 their attack. They are no longer targeting foreign nationals, foreign drivers. They are targeting the industry itself, the truck, the truck industry in the country. Meaning that they have seen that attacking foreigners doesn't work. Now they are targeting the industry itself. I don't know if you see where I'm going. How long before similar groups start attacking other industries, which they perceive are hiring foreign nationals? Academia. All of you guys should be worried. 
uh, international, international organizations, <laughs> hospitals. So that, again, to show that this is not just about foreigners, but also all of us who live in the country. So, xenophobia virus undermines the rule of law. And it's dangerous. It's even more dangerous when the state is complicit. And the state complicity manifests in many ways. First of all, of course, xenophobic populism, as just mentioned. The second way uh, the, is the direct involvement. And the third is lack of decisive, decisive response. So when the state is a complicit, complicit in, in undermining the rule of law, then we are all in danger. And states are expected to resolve group conflicts. When they don't, they take part in the, in the conflict itself, then it becomes dangerous. And we have examples of genocide in Rwanda, in Sudan, in the what's happening in South Africa, because the states, instead of resolving the conflict, have decided to be part of the conflict itself. Thank you. So, more police means less crime. This is what our police ministers and the police want us to believe, and you'll hear this statement made, what happens to be made recently. But if you want to look at what's going on in South Africa, um, it is interesting that politicians are saying things like tax by foreign nationals, the police, is undermining the law. If you take a bigger step back and look at this, uh, that is a small incident in a much bigger process that's been unfolding for some time. So what we do is we track uh, various kinds of violence and violent organized crime with indicators about what's driving security in South Africa. Between 1994 and 2012, the murder rate in South Africa dropped by 54%, more than half numbers of murders. But since 2012, last year, the murder rate increased by 19%, which means that last year there were 4,750 more murders 20,300 murders that year than there was in 2012, six years ago, which is around 13 or 14 more murders every single day last year than there was a case six years before. When it comes to armed robberies, people have been attacked on the streets, in their homes, in their businesses, in their vehicles. Armed robberies increased by almost 40,000 instances reported to the police <coughs> last year. So in 2012, 100,000 cases were opened by the police reported to the police last year, just under 140,000 cases. So that's over 110 more armed attacks across the country every single day on average. We are able to identify the locations where these murders and attacks take place because we look at the crime statistics for every single one of the 1,144 police precincts across the country. Only 148 of those precincts, uh, about 13%, record 50% of all murders. If you go into murder, we start realizing that two out of three murders is between young men, often under or unemployed, getting into an argument about something, and you, which ends in a physical fight, and one will kill other. Uh, about 20% of murders, 15 to 20% are related to robberies. So the robbery goes up also and increases the, the rate of murders. If you break down group murders, pretty much gangsterism, vigilante attacks uh, are the drivers of most of murders. So there's about 900 gang related murders about 8, 890 vigilante murders in a year. A vast majority, I wouldn't know what percentage, but maybe more than 90% of these murders, if not 95%, are committed by South Africans against other South Africans. The biggest increase in murder in the last two years has been against women. So the national murder rate went up by 6.9%, but against women, 11%. And amongst children, 17%. So the violence is taking place in people's homes. So what are the police doing about? Raiding people, making a living in the inner city, selling so-called counterfeit goods. Why are they doing this? Because policing is inherently political. Everywhere in the world. We know that if the police adhere to very strict principles about being seen to be credible, to be fair, to uphold people's dignity, and they have high levels of public trust, then they have the biggest impact on public safety. People tend to commit less crime, more likely to adhere to the rules, the laws, and you have a much more stable and safer society. But unfortunately in South Africa, whereas that is actually in our documents, it's in our constitution, it's in the policy documents, the reality is very different. And why is that? 
Well, there was a big effort at reform since 1994, and it improved things tremendously. But from about 2006, when Jackie Salabi was fighting corruption investigations, we saw things starting to get a bit wobbly. And then from 2009, with President Zuma's appointment to presidency, we started to see what has been termed by the National Development Plan as a serial crisis of health management in the Middle East. So we ended up having six different people occupy the seat of National Commissioner between Jackie Salerno and 2017. For 17 years, not one of those people who ran the police, the most powerful officer in the police, was a trained police officer. They were civilian, chosen primarily because of their political loyalty to the president and willingness to support the dominant faction in the governing party. So what does this mean for policing? Well, fortunately for us, it, uh, it was delayed the destruction because we had the World Cup in 2010. So huge amounts of money were pumped in. We had international policing agencies <coughs> training people. Everybody was happy. Um, but when that was pulled out after the World Cup, uh, 2011, things started slowly declining. In 2012 to last year, we saw a massive decline. We saw big reductions in abilities of the police to detect those committing murders and robberies. So right now, if you commit a murder, um, you've got a 75% chance of getting away with it. And there's some precincts like Hammond's Kral where there's been over 260 murders in the last two years and not one single conviction. And there are many precincts like that. Hammond's Kral is not completely overrun by foreign nationals. Um, so if you look at the big picture and you look at the impact of state capture on the criminal justice system, there's a huge amount of body work that goes into this. You can see that our, our serious problems about public safety and policing are not about foreign nationals. If we kicked out every single foreign national in South Africa, our crime rate would barely budge because most of the violence and crimes committed by South Africans. Some foreign nationals commit crimes, that's true. A vast bulk of all crimes committed by South Africans. The solution is not kicking foreign nationals out. It is making sure that we demand that our police minister and our government put some competent, trained professionals as police officers who see their job as improving the image of the police with every interaction they have with civilian. Right now, when you see a police officer, you have no idea if it's going to be a good cop or a bad cop. They're going to hitch up with a bribe, or they're going to be an excellent uh, source of information. That can change. We have enough good cops who have everything in place except the leadership at the moment. Uh, and that needs to change. So I'll end there and we can discuss this further.
The way search and seizures are being carried out in the inner city, such industrial forensic process is often impossible. Firstly, often big brand owners actually couldn't be bothered and can't even be contacted by the police, right? They, they uh, seized, like, like, let's say, 20 seemingly Nike shoes. Nike says, we don't have the time to deal with this. And even if they are reached, they don't have a local expert available who would come and inspect the goods and write the appropriate report. report. Often also police sees so much di different goods that multiple brand owners would have to be contacted, which is basically beyond the capacity of the police. Also in many cases, the original brand owners are not even identifiable. You know, is this really a counterfeit good or is this just like an invention of somebody? And mostly, the goods seized are cheap goods which come from China, but only because something comes from China doesn't mean automatically it's counterfeit. Uh, the reality then was that basic paperwork, which was necessary to elevate the cases to be taken serious by a court and not chucked out immediately, was rarely available. So instead then, suspects were released before the 24 hour timeline and their goods were simply destroyed and these traders would not dare to demand their goods. Counterfeit policing operates on a very murky legal terrain, which often can lead to arrests because there's the impulse, the, the, the law is there, which can be evoked, but rarely a proper legal process. process. It is thus conducive for police to work in a gray zone of heightened police discretion, which we know leads to corruption, but very little accountability towards the law. My second point is more about if then the police were indeed successfully policing the circulation of counterfeit goods, in whose interest is it? Counterfeit goods are generally very popular goods. Most people are under no illusion that they are buying the real thing when they are buying counterfeit goods. The originals are often expensive goods, markers of class and belonging, which are made accessible through counterfeiting them to those who normally can't afford them. They are a shortcut to classiness, or one could say. In many ways, they democratize exclusivity. The argument against counterfeiting is often presented as a moral argument that buying counterfeit goods is stealing from the one who had the original idea. But firstly, these are not people but companies. And secondly, people won't buy the original if there was no counterfeit, because they simply can't, could not afford it. So it's not really competing markets yet. Thus, if the police capacity is now employed to police these brands, in which interest is it really? What they do is they protect the exclusivity of these goods, maybe even their profits. But with many of these companies not even being in South Africa, South Africa won't see much of a return either. In other words, it is simply policing in the name of a consumer capitalism. This happens under the banner of public-private partnership. I always thought that public-private partnerships means to put the private in the, to the service of the public, for example, to run a hospital better. But in this case, it is simply means to make scarce state resources available for international capitalist companies. The police is doing the rough work for profit somewhere else. Finally, and this is more an interpretive uh, stance, trying to understand what goes on in the rhetoric of police and many South African people who support these rough interventions in the inner city. Why is it that the issue of counterfeiting is then so successfully employed to criminalize foreigners? I think it is a heightened politics of suspicion which plays on police and people's mind. The distinction which seemingly can be made between goods, a fake and authentic, is transposed onto people as true and false citizens. The conclusion is made that selling fake goods equals to being not, uh, not a true citizen. One could even go further here. Fake goods, they index at the same and at the same time re reveal a particular rapacious, rapacious capitalist force, namely the making of money out of nothing, so to say, which is the exponential increase of value to, due to the brand attached to it. Such capitalist savviness and exploitative knowledge is then projected onto foreigners and contrasted with how the seemingly upright and bound to more authentic as in rural or traditional African values are being exploited. So just to repeat this, this is not what I'm thinking. This is an interpretation of how the counterfeit good is mobilized.
criminalized in criminalize, criminalizing. So having lived as long as I have from where I drew, which has been four years, you get to form relationships with people. Every morning, I get on the metro bus to come to work in Brown Point Day. And so the people I spend time with, mainly elderly people, I've come to have many conversations with them. Sometimes it's about the cost of living, sometimes we are talking about the state of governance, and sometimes it's the severe weather patterns that have emerged all across the world. What has been really interesting in the last couple of weeks, um, following the response to the police action in the inner city, what we have been discussing every day has been the illegals. The language that has been used by people who are very similar to me, people who could easily be my mother, my brother, my sister, or even me, people whom I felt a kin, you know, a kinship with, because I've seen us as people who share the same values, have suddenly been talking about the illegals, the counterfeit goods, the baddies. And this is a direct product of the language that has been used. It is the language that has been normalized. When the state talks about the illegals who are coming in and the need to protect the sovereignty of South Africa, when a whole mayor refers to people as a disease, it speaks to things we have seen before in the past. The need to dehumanize people and make others feel that I can refer to you this way because you are less human than I am. We have seen this process all across the world. It's not unique to South Africa. In the US right now, in Hungary, in India, and so on. We have seen many people using this kind of language <coughs> And in the time that they have emerged and taken power, we've also seen the number of hate crimes and xenophobic violence in those areas increase, very similarly to ours. Now the thing about language and how it's normalized is that this is the language that is used by the state, this is the language that is used by private interests that are trying to protect their, you know, the ability to exploit and access cheap labor, it is also that it is reported and used as the normal language of the day. It is reported without rebuttals, and thus becomes the language which we turn to. Now, unfortunately, when you refer to a human being as being an illegal person, you are de facto criminalizing their very humanity. You are saying that by merely existing, they are criminal. You are invoking in people's minds the idea of this person who is creeping in, who is only going to come and do you harm. It is by no mistake that this is happening as well. All across the world, we are seeing a rise in inequality. We are seeing a huge climate crisis. And we are also seeing devastation of all other forms. In South Africa, more particularly, we're also looking at a high rise in unemployment. And unfortunately, the failure of governance, the failure of leadership, means that those who do not have the vision and the political will, or even the humanity or desire to use the power they have to act, will find a way to scapegoat others will find a way to say, this is not a failure of governance. This is not a failure of a healthcare system. They are too many. They are overburdening. And unfortunately, when you do that, and you are speaking to already existing prejudices, it is a call to action. It is saying to people that, you do not have because they are taking away from you. Now the other reason, part of the, the reason the violence also manifests in this way, is not because the immigrant or the migrant is responsible for any of these things I've spoken about, the inequality, 
the climate crisis? Not at all. It's a way of also ensuring that we are so busy attacking each other, we have no time to address the disease. The direct, the companies that are polluting in the ways that they are, and that are causing all of this harm in this world. But at the same time, we also see that it is a manifestation of the ability to victimize people without the fear of retaliation. The knowledge that because there is this existing sentiment, I can attack and nothing will happen to me. I mean, Gareth has just spoken about, you know, the conviction rates and so on for different kinds of murders. And when it is done to someone who is already other than considered not human, you can get away with it further. Now, unfortunately, what has happened is so-called progressive ideas or progressive people and how we talk, we also reuse that very same language that de further dehumanizes, you know, in our so-called response to it. But part of it also, we've decided to fact check, right? So we give the facts that, you know, immigrants are providing the jobs. This is what's going on. This is the reality, you know. South Africans are committing more crimes. Unfortunately, you cannot fact check feelings. When a sentiment is put in to what is an already existing understanding of reality, you will not be able to address that with facts. And those who want to push forward these ideas of dehumanization and so forth are actually speaking to people's feelings, people's material realities, invoking what already exists in society to push it even further. So I would say that that's part of the limitation, that we further legitimize this language that's being used by those who want to do harm, but also that our response is so deeply inadequate <coughs> because it does not speak to where people are. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's very hard to speak uh, after so many uh, good points have been made already. Um, but I wanted to start my brief input by, by making reference to Ben Oku, the Nigerian writer. Early this year, in, uh, in, uh, in March, he published his uh, latest novel, Freedom Artist, uh, which I had the privilege of, uh, of reviewing. In that book, he paints a picture not just of a country, but of a world in which people have forgotten their founding myths, or better still, are forced to forget the founding myth, because the founding myth is too uncomfortable, it's too, uh, it's too dangerous. Um, the other very important thought in that book is that there is a police force. Uh, you spoke about the police having a, a political function. The police force in that world is actually cannibalistic. Uh, instead of uh, controlling, doing riot control, they simply eat up the people. And uh, the rich join them in eating up the people. And so in that country, you have many people without limbs, which have been beaten off by the police. Uh, and I think it's a very dramatic, uh, if you like, almost um, haunting depiction of the function that police can be put to. And you read that book, uh, you see many African countries. You also see many European countries, uh, in my view, in that book. The, 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 and, and part of the problem in South Africa, I think, is uh, has to do with our founding myths. So we called ourselves a rainbow nation. And some people are beginning to contest that. And I think because our founding myth did not really uh, deal with issues of our 
place in Africa, for example, or issues of our woundedness as a people. Our founding myths tended to brush over those kinds of things, whether we are an African country or just a country in Africa, whether we are so wounded that we will need more than the TRC to deal with our, our, our pain and our woundedness as a people. So that's one thought. Um, the other, of course, is a, I mean, so if you watch the Black Panther, uh, that great nation of Africa, Wakanda, uh, was, uh, was strong because, uh, among other things, vibranium was discovered in Wakanda. And so they could build all sorts of technological advances. Uh, they had a foundation. Um, and that's what made them tick. You could argue that South Africa had a foundation in 1866, discovery of gold and diamond, and then, of course, uh, 1948, discovery of apartheid um, also uh, helped the nation continue to survive. So what happens when a nation discovers a scapegoat, a new scapegoat? Uh, is that a moment of progress also? Uh, because I have a sense that what has happened is that since 1994, you could argue that since 1999, perhaps when the arms deal uh, was signed, uh, South Africa has been looking for a new scapegoat. And we have found a wonderful <coughs> scapegoat in foreign missionaries um, for all our ills. And from time to time, since 2008, Whenever the pressure is up, we look for them, uh, and we find them, and we deal with them, and we feel better, it seems to me. Unfortunately, if you look at uh, the 2008 um, xenophobic attacks, as has been already said by many of my colleagues, of the 60-something deaths, um, a third of that were South Africans. So, and I want to to reiterate the point that has been made by many others. So when we talk about xenophobic attacks, there is a sense in which we are running out of language. Uh, it is inadequate language to describe what we see as xenophobic attacks, or even as xenophobia, or even to describe it as failure of, of policing. I think we are scrambling for a language to describe this phenomenon, because what happens actually <coughs> is that there is a lot of misogyny. Um, women get raped and attacked in the process. Um, there's a lot of ethnocentrism uh, in that process. There's a lot of, um, of, um, of, of violence in general um, in, in the process. So I'm not convinced that this label is helpful in order for us to understand uh, what is really going on there. Now, to conclude, because I see I've already uh, been flagged, uh, the yellow card. Um, so Kwame appeared many years ago, more than 20 years ago, um, uh, in, his, um, in my father's house, argued that part of, and, and this argument has been repeated by many others ever since, a part of the problem in Africa is that we have got this idea of being a homogeneous. We're always looking for a way to describe ourselves as a people who are homogeneous, um, who are united in some ways, either united as victims or united as victors, imaginary victors. And so we set ourselves up for disappointment every time we discover that actually we are not that united um, as, as, as a people that our unity is uh, imaginary, and that even colonialism does not actually unite us because we've experienced it differently, uh, to different extents in different parts of Africa. And I want to suggest that South Africans have not really come to terms with their own kind of colonialism um, as victims of that, and that's part of what we are seeing now. Ultimately, it's not the question is no longer who is African, who is not African, who is South African, who is not South African. 
The question is, who's human? And it is, it is in that sense that we see people uh, being, being killed. It's because those who are, whose lives are expendable are not really human, which is why we have all, a whole list of words, Makwerekwere, Magrigamba, Shangans. We have a whole list of words that we use which generally describe these people who are not yeah, really human. I stop there. All right, I'm going to sit here for now. Uh, I'm going to come get a microphone. Let me begin by, by thanking all of you. I think the, I came here to learn and to listen, and I think I fulfilled my mission, uh, but I want to learn and listen uh, more. I think you're absolutely right to say that this is a discussion that is about feelings. It's about what it means to be South African, what it means to live with others, what it means to be human, what are our obligations to each other and, and to the people that we think are not. Uh, like us, and, and even though we can not counter um, myths or we cannot counter sentiment with facts, we can explore the implications of those sentiments for the, the real world in which we live in. And I think all of you have, have highlighted uh, in very different ways what some of those implications uh, might be. I don't want to hog the floor, so I'm going to open it um, to anyone who, who wants to, to ask questions. Uh, please. This is a topic of which I think we all have strong feelings, so I'm going to have kept the speakers to a, a, a very short time, and I might have, yeah, I hope I don't have to hold up my stop sign for any of the questioners. Um, but I'm going to go, let's take three at a time. You each have a microphone in front of you or near you, so just press on that to see the light goes on, and you can, you can speak. So why don't we start here? Please just also introduce yourselves. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my name is David Monda. I'm a doctoral candidate from the City University of New York, and I'm doing some research uh, here in Johannesburg on African migrants and the experiences in the city of Johannesburg, specifically in relation to xenophobia. Um, so my observation slash question is specifically in relation to a lot of the discourse we've had today. I you know, in, in the readings and literature and in, in my interviews and discussions and observations, I tend to see a mismatch between the ideals of the South African constitution, as progressive as it is, and the benefits that the state provides, the support that the state provides to refugees and asylum seekers. There seems to be a, a, a mismatch between the high ideals of the constitution as good as they are, and the reality of the size of the economy and its capacity to support um, refugees and asylum seekers, many of whom come from the rest of the continent, a majority of whom don't actually try to go to Europe or the US, they end up coming into, into South Africa. So I'd just like you to speak to that specific element, should the myth of the rainbow nation be confronted specifically within the discourse of what can we conceivably in an economic sense actually provide as respite for people who are coming here seeking support or asylum. Uh, should there be a realistic national narrative about the, the ability of the economy to provide for uh, refugees and asylum seekers? I see one in the back. Good evening everyone. Tabo uh, is my name. I'm interested uh, in this topic of discussion. So I think scholarship for some people. Just uh, in, in order to understand sort of learn bigger ways of approaching uh, all the hinted subjects of migration, policing within urban, within our eight metros. So that's the domestic point of view. Um, my question to Edmund and Victor is like, obviously, like with, with the issue of uh, immigration, it's always like a interaction point with like different uh, regulatory systems, um, human rights um, uh, communities, and also the interaction with law. Um, we've recently seen in Joburg that uh, there's some comments about the counterfeit uh, industry and the goods market and trade, and there being interaction with police. Now, I want, I want to understand, is, is there a, a, a way that we can actually like have a policing system that actually prioritizes all these issues, 
within an approach and a framework of, of dealing with them. Because I guess in the reportage, uh, which is the print media aspect and the, what generally goes on uh, within the, the Twitter sphere, is that you, you, you have polarizing views most of the time. And I'm, I'm just really confused as how do we understand uh, these issues from a community community-based, located point of view. So that's my quick question from Mr. Manrika. Um, the other question, I think, some of the questions are around uh, policing in South Africa. I think I'll, I'll just take them as, 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 as comments. And, yeah, so thank you.
but it's just because of the incapacity of the police that so much of these soft targets are constantly being pulled in. And counterfeit goods lend itself to it, but you know, the DVD stuff, copyright stuff as well, um, and just the pure effect of people being illegal already is enough for that. But on the other hand, I do think that there is overall a strange understanding of who, whose peace is the police to keep. And I think this has a lot to do with a kind of uh, continuation of um, providing service to those who are supposed to run the economy, those who provide the economy. So those are, that there's a lot of kind of illegal things which go on there, and even with the big companies, if you take big pharma companies, right, the police doesn't even come close to the criminality which goes on. And so, again, the, the policing is pushed to the, to the limits of where people are very easily available to be policed. And that's always the people who are lowest in the category, who are lowest in, who are available, who have no protection. You know, the absence of protection. Because the moment you scale up, people already have private security. And that will clash with the police, right? So the police is often working on that lowest level. I know from having worked with the police for, for many years before, they don't want to go into the suburbs because then they're standing in front of walls. They don't even know how to police houses which have big walls and dogs behind it, right? So there's, a, there's always that push factor towards the soft spots and that is always doubling with a certain lower class, working class, and then like people said here, the dehumanized uh, population. So I think there is a reproduction of a colonial project in a, in a very big picture. But I think the challenge is also to see how it is produced. Okay, I just wanted to ask, while we're on the policing of Gareth, if you wanted to say anything on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, in a very simple way, it's if you're told, as a ship commander at a police station, you've got to make 10 or 15 arrests a day. It's not easy to find guys carrying firearms or hitting people uh, between 6 and 8 in the evening walking from train stations because your shift probably ends at 6 o'clock. But it is easy to make 15 arrests by 10 o'clock in the morning, which gives the rest of the day to other things. So um, it's about that ethos, the chasing statistics. Because the, the leadership at the top have become destabilized, infighting, mistrust, revival all the time, the systems for resourcing the police training and making sure they get their standards have broken down. Uh, we've seen a big reduction in the number of disciplinary cases over the last few years against police officers who have allegedly committed crimes against people. Massive increases in the amount of money being ordered by the courts to, for the police to pay out to victims of police misconduct. So basically, in the last decade, it's been an almost 800% increase. Last year, it was 330 million rand. The police were ordered by the courts to pay out to the proven victims of police misconduct and criminality. And in response to that, we've seen a decline in virtually every indicator of public credibility and improvement of trust against the police. So it's quite odd that um, the police are doing something which they think the community want to do. But in fact, it's not having a desired result at all. And it is a leadership challenge. It won't change until you have a, uh, the people who sit at the top of this very paramilitary organization are completely uh, wedded to the constitutional values, are highly experienced in what works in a democracy in diverse societies. This has been studied for over 100 years, so there are no real um, secrets about this. You make sure that the police's main objective in every interaction is to build public trust amongst everybody and particularly amongst vulnerable groups. And if you can do that, it's only then do your police have a hope in actually providing public safety. That's why I started really saying it's not more police, it's better police. If you add more police to a dysfunctional policing system, you have more police corruption, you have more police brutality, and you have a greater reduction in public trust in state. You guys are really lifting my spirit. <laughs> Yeah, I, I grew up in Soweto, and I, I, my first arrest by the police was when I was 14 years old. So I've learned not to trust police. Uh, not in this country or in any other country. I have a, a, a natural, almost naturalized allergic reaction. Now, 
I, I, I understand that you know police have to do their job, there are rules, there are laws, but I think we must understand that ultimately police are a tool. They are a state tool. And, and to that extent, they are controlled by the politicians. So if the politicians make the kinds of noises that he was, uh, he was referring to, the police are going to go out into a restaurant like they did uh, a few days ago, found two beautiful South African women, black, black police, black South African women, arrest them because they looked Ethiopian and they smelled Ethiopian. That's what the police said in the report. And, 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 and another woman was, was made to give birth um, while standing at Mamilodi uh, Hospital because she is Zimbabwe and she must go back to Zimbabwe. So it is, the, it is not so much the, 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 the operational skills of police alone that will solve this problem. It's the ideology that the police are being fed with. And at an ideological level, I don't see that leadership. So you can make this machine very efficient, the policing machine. If the ideology is wrong, they are going to make the roadblocks in the squatter camps, but never in the suburbs. They are going to arrest um, uh, poor people. They are going to raid. Uh, and, and so we need to address the ideological um, uh, menu that is being fed the police, uh, it seems to me. And, and, and I would say the same thing about it, because we must remember, Marikana, was Marikana an accident? I don't think it was. Uh, and one of the recommendations of the Fallon Commission was that they must go and learn how to write police properly. They must be trained. Um, and, and maybe they should be trained properly. But as long as the, the, the ideology that the politicians feed them is wrong, they are going to do the wrong things. And, and I think that needs to be addressed. The same goes for the question of um, law and, and immigration. I just want to say this. The, the borders that we have, I know this point has been made before, between Mozambique and South Africa, Zimbabwe and South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia and the DRC, Zambia and Angola, Zambia and, and uh, they've got many, many uh, uh, borders in Zambia. Africans have always been moving across these borders for hundreds of years. There's nothing new about Africans moving across these borders, because these borders are imaginary anyway. What has changed is that we have formed these countries and now we criminalize people uh, who, who, who move across them. So one of, the, one of the macro solutions to this problem lies with the AU and with SADC at a political level. Do we need to keep this? Um, I mean, the, the African passport is one of the most hideous things to own because it prevents you to move across Africa and it prevents you to move in the rest of the world. So one of the macro <coughs> solutions is really to rethink the borders um, and, and not merely to tinker with the, with the little things, rule of law and all of those things, fix them. You can fix them, but until you fix ideologically and politically in terms of how, what arrangements we have between African countries, um, I doubt if it will, it will be sustainable. I can't remember your question. I'm just, if either of you want, I'm either end, you can't see each other, so. We can throw it at the end. Let go um, very quickly. I wanted to talk about this much about um, between um, constitution and realities of, or support to refugees and asylum seekers. I want to remind you actually that that is much, it's not only between the constitution and religion or migrant, it's also between the constitution itself and the citizens. Because the, the rights in the constitution are not realized even for most of South Africans, South Africans. 
which not only about refugees and asylum seekers and migrants who are not um, are getting those rights that are in the Constitution. So um, this is one of the things we've been talking about. There are some programs that are there to help refugees and asylum seekers. And when they help those, those programs are helping people living among South Africans who are equally poor, who also don't have access to those constitutional rights. What actually that what happens is that you are reinforcing the, the divide between the two groups. So pushing for the more support to, to refugees and asylum seekers could do more harm than good because of the need. As, as we speak, because there is no support for refugees and asylum seekers, at least not, not a lot from the government. Some citizens feel that they are taking away a lot from, from the citizens, from, from them. Let's imagine what would happen then if the, the government would increase the support uh, to refugees and asylum seekers. So I think what we've been trying to say with SMS research is that we can only push for inclusive programming. If you have a program to support people in this space, support everybody who is in need. If you go pick and choose migrants and refugees, it's going to cause more harm. And, um, and we also been saying, look, the only thing that can help us in our cities is some kind of inclusive governance. That includes everyone, including migrants and citizens, meaning that there are opportunities that are available to be shared equally, but also the responsibilities, shared um, opportunities and shared responsibilities I think would be helpful, instead of just focusing on helping the police, migrating other, other members of the, the, the community. So I think we forget that South Africa by design is designed to exclude. Think about our cities, right? Um, who belongs in public space? The fact that we got boom gates that tell some people that you don't belong. Think about Operation Fiela, Operation Clean Sweep. We human beings are described as folk that need to be cleaned off our street, right? So there's a long history of disdain against the poor, against the black, against those who are seen to be less powerful, right? And so this is, I completely agree, it is a bloody ideological thing, right? The police itself does not exist outside of this. So the police function in itself being about who it is supposed to serve We've seen it over and over again, that the police actually can be efficient when it comes to protecting elite interests, right? And we cannot talk about elite interests as only the being the state, right? Over and over, whether we're talking about, you know, the current so-called state capture issues, and before, private interests have always colluded with the state, and therefore private interests have been able to also mobilize police resources to protect the interests. This is a deeply, deeply ideological thing. <coughs> and so, yeah, so I think also when we think of, when we're thinking about our cities and some of the functions these state services are supposed to serve, it is a mistake to see it, yeah, solely as an operational matter, right? You can have the most functional service of all. You can have a very trusted service of all that if at an ideological level it is unable to recognize that public space belongs to all who exist in it, that public space is for the public, and that there are not certain people who constitute the public and others are the other, you will continue to have a problem. And it's not unique to police. I'm talking about you know the just South Africa inherently by design. And I like the thing about the founding myths, right, also. You know, we went through a very traumatic time as a country, you know, and to kind of like ease us into this idea that, you know, we can all be one in some kind of bloody rainbow. You had to invoke a nationalism, a national identity, right? You had to invoke this kind of sense of you are special, you are exceptional, look at each other, you are the only human beings who exist. And these are some of the things we need to undo. So it is good that these things are being questioned. It's good that it's out there. But on the other hand as well, inequality, inequality breeds conflict. Inequality breeds violence, you know? We can talk about violence in its different manifestations. We can talk about the physical violence, 
we can talk about, it manifests very differently, but inequality will always breed violence, and unfortunately, that violence will always be directed at those who it is seen to be much more acceptable towards. I remember when Operation Clean Sweep and Operation Fear were happening here in the city, people were busy supporting the city, saying, now I feel safe, you know, because these people are all over the, you know, the pavement that I walk in. As if the traders, the street vendors, were the ones who are committing crime. As if they themselves were not being robbed by people. As if they themselves are not human enough to deserve the protection that any other person needs. You know? And some of these systems we're talking about, I suppose what I'm struggling with, right, is how we talk about like this individual manifestation and the systemic one as if they don't exist together. They are individuals, people, groups, who deliberately and actively uphold these systems because they benefit from them. Mm -hmm. There is money that is made by kicking certain people out. There are certain things that are made from certain things, you know? And so these things will always exist with each other. Yeah, so anyway, it's just a little frustration I have. <laughs> I'm going to follow up on the question about um, asylum seekers and refugees accessing services, um, especially accessing healthcare. Um, I'm not sure, sure if you're familiar with how the process works around asylum and refugees, but people apply for asylum and while home affairs try to determine their status, there are these permits. Um, the permits aren't long term, sometimes it's given for a month or three months or six months and it continually has to be renewed. Um, I've met people who has been on um, asylum for 10 years um, and as an asylum seeker you do not qualify for free health care. So I've written about a, a number of people, um, kidney failure and so on, who are essentially dying and state hospitals are telling them we can't treat you, um, you, you, you must pay. And I mean it's exorbitant amounts of money to pay. Um, there's actually a case of an European asylum seeker in court this week uh, trying to access um, dialysis treatment and she's in her mid-20s um, and she's been on asylum for quite a while. So, yeah, um, I, just a comment. I think we have time for, we have time for a, another quick round. I see two hands with Jacob and uh, there's a few more. So I'll just ask you to go quickly. Uh, before, we did get one question over Twitter, so like I should read this one. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's really aimed at young, but perhaps could also be answered by others, which is essentially asking, these are important issues, how come the media coverage on these issues have been so appalling? Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe you can <laughs> reflect on, on that. Whereas immigration is something, as, as Kigetz was saying, people talk about every day, and yet it only appears in the media when, people, when immigrants are getting killed or rounded up. So wh why are those discussions not happening? So why don't we, we can just start with Yaakov and then we'll move our way back. Um, okay. um, the, I just want to continue on the um, threat on um, the uh, changing the ideology and what will change the ideology. And I, my question is, and maybe also linking to what Julia said around policing, the ideology that informs our current policing that focuses on the weak, in particular migrant traders, and, and that it's a function of poor management uh, that Gather talked about, but it's also serving um, private interests. So I was wondering that, and Jan started the conversation by saying that the narrative created around the, um, the police raid was that the response by the migrant traders was attack on our national security. It's a national security threat. And it obviously wasn't. But what if it becomes one? So what if there is a response um, in other African countries to the policing in South Africa of migrant communities? And what made me think of this was uh, a conversation I had earlier today by reports that these, um, the attacks on foreign truck drivers um, will be met by a response in neighboring countries on um, attacks on South African truck drivers, and will that um, perk up ears of the 
commercial interests um, in South Africa as those South African companies have all businesses there. And I also remember in 2015 and also in 2008 in Nigeria, there were threats made. I don't think there was ever a, an actual implementation of those threats, but those threats certainly reached the political ears. And I was just wondering whether one could imagine that that could form part of a, um, a uh, something that will change the political ideology uh, and then maybe just a last comment. Ideology is obviously informed or takes the form of laws and policy. And our immigration policy is um, is a very ex exclusionary policy and laws, and it has become even more restrictive over years. And um, and so um, that narrative around who who, com who can comply um, with the strict uh, requirements set by the laws. Um, will never be a, um, a reality. Thank you. And if we could, again, to, I promise that we let our, our speakers go before too long, so, uh, yeah. Um, so speaking to the Operation Fiela program that the City of Johannesburg has, um, I would just like the panel to further expand on the issue of how Johannesburg is, is branded that um, it's problematic that this world-class African city has pockets of informality that do not contribute or are not even part of the image that is portrayed, um, sorry, portrayed by the state, which in turn is covered by the blanket of the issue of immigration and illegal immigrants. Hi. Um, so it seems to me that uh, our police force is, a, is of a very colonial nature, right, and con colonial thinking. So the policies and the policing, the, the policing and military sy systems and strategies are also very colonial. So then this is why it's, they're so very comfortable with um, infringing on people's basic human rights. Uh, because this is some, like all they know, because we know that most of our um, and the people in the police force are black men that were probably there in the struggle um, during apartheid. So now we have this internalized sense of inferiority that allows it to be acceptable for them to be inhumane people. And because they see themselves as barely human, they treat other people they see as equally non-human in this manner. So is training police officials a good enough approach in dealing with immigration issues, or are we just enabling them to be better at legally bullying and discriminating against the marginalized people? Fantastic. I'm sure there are more questions, but because we have to wrap up, what I'm going to do is let give the, all of the, the speakers a chance to reply quickly to the ones that they feel, or to offer a, a final comment, and then invite you all to join us outside, and you can assault them uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, want to, I want to take a different uh, side to this. And that's why I, I think I... I uh, okay, Dimir, can you do it in one minute? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, and let me be a bit controversial here. Uh, the question for me, and uh, mainly to the panel, is that are we not too harsh on the South African state? Um, the reason for, for saying that, uh, migration management is a very complex matter. Um, at, at, at a distance, perhaps it looks you can you know easily get to, to, to solutions of that. I would I would ask John also to say that, isn't it that, what, what would be appropriate response of the state last uh, two weeks ago in, in Johannesburg City? What would have been the appropriate response of the South African state to the situation in Johannesburg? And perhaps the reason why I'm asking this question is simply because you know until um, the, the, the the end of the previous century. 